My name uh, is Sarah Austin, and I would also like to thank um, Uncle Colin for his warm welcome and extend uh, my acknowledgement to the Wurundjeri people uh, and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and offer that respect to um, any First Nations people here with us today. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, it's, I also want to thank TNA, University of Melbourne, MTC, Abbotsford Convent, because it's genuinely terrific to have this gathering today. It feels like a long time um, since this diverse field of practice has been in the same room and I for one am really excited to be here with my peers today. Um, I'm going to do the world's briefest intro about who I am and concentrate on something else. So uh, I am a theatre maker who works uh, right across the field of practice. I make work uh, in the early years space with babies. Uh, I work with five to 12 year olds and uh, with teenagers. Um, I make work sometimes for those age groups and sometimes with those age groups for adult audiences. I also work with emerging artists um, on a program recently called Let's Take Over with Dara Benartz, which I think you can hear a little bit about with Bo McCafferty later today. It's an unbelievable world-class program, so do go and hear about that. Um, so that's me. Um, and today I'm going to try to take you on a 15-minute journey into a four-year research project, <laughs> which is my PhD, which should be finished in a month or may never be finished, it's very hard to tell at this point. <laughs> this has been a practice-led investigation, which I've done at the VCA, into what might constitute an ethical practice for working with children in contemporary performance. And specifically, my focus has been the particular phenomenon of adult artists collaborating with children to make contemporary performance for adult audiences. In this research, I identify that the particular rise of this practice aligns with the decimation of youth arts companies. 21 recurrently federally funded companies in 2007, and this was drastically and devastatingly reduced to four in 2016. I have some suggestions about what, why this may be, but I'm not gonna talk about them now. You can find me at a coffee. Uh, my research project begins with this image. Despite garnering considerable acclaim worldwide, including ex exhibiting as part of the 2005 Venice Biennale, in 2008, following a, high, a, a complaint from a high-profile children's protection advocate, New South Wales Police seized 20 artworks from the Rosen Oxley Gallery in Sydney prior to the opening of an exhibition by celebrated Australian photographer Bill Henson. At the time, the New South Wales Department of Public Prosecutions investigated building a complaint of child pornography against Henson. The works in question were part of Henson's ongoing investigation into the liminal state of childhood and adolescence, and as the artist argued at the time, they were part of the Western tradition of nudes. Further adding to the public concern was then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's denouncement of the work as disgusting, and in response to the narratives of sexuality that the work explored, Rudd publicly stated he believed we should just let kids be kids. There are many ways of framing this moment in Australian art history, and there are questions of authorship, morality, censorship, and free speech, which all emerge in an interrogation of why this occurred and how it played out in the public arena. There are also many ways to critically and ethically engage with Henson's complex and beautiful works depicting adolescence. From my perspective, as a theatre practitioner who makes contemporary performance work with and for children and young people, and at the time of this controversy, I was the artistic director of St Martin's Youth Arts Centre here in Melbourne, this became a watershed moment in my practice. I was particularly caught with Rudd's statement, just let kids be kids and the kind of overwhelming popular support that this notion seemed to have. What were the discourses that were shaping and defining these understandings of childhood that Rudd was referring to? Who was responsible for creating, circulating and maintaining these ideas? And crucially for the work that I wanted to make, where was the voice of children in this debate? 
and what agency did they have in addressing these views of them? I find myself in a contradictory ethical position when I think about Henson and these photographs. I do not see these images as pornographic and I certainly appreciate their artistic value. I am, however, confronted by them and I recognise this as the point of these images and the conversation that they are designed to provoke. As a theatre maker who works with children and young people, I am acutely aware of the responsibility of constructing the frame from within which the young people are viewed. At times, I have seen contemporary performance work featuring children where I have also felt confronted and wondered about the ethics of creation and of production and whether they were questionable. Henson's works and my experiences over the last decade of seeing and making work for adult audiences that features children on stage raise the very ideas that are central to my research project. Questions of how children might function as political symbols in art and how the process of creation and framing of work needs careful ethical consideration. The last decade has seen the rapid rise of contemporary and experimental performance works that feature children on stage as performers and collaborators and that are created specifically for adult audiences. So I'm sure you all know the works that I'm talking about. In 2016, three of Lynn Gardner's top ten theatre shows for The Guardian UK were these with shows that were had children on stage that were created for adult audiences. We're talking about critically acclaimed performances led by artists like Tim Etchells, Gob Squad, Heine Goebbels, Milo Rao, Untrungud. And of course, some of these are also made by Australian artists. In Melbourne alone, we have seen theatre companies Fort Outfit and The Rabble, artists Samara Hirsch and Lara Toms creating works that feature child performers that are created for adult audiences. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. What my research suggests is that these works stage ideas of childhood and children that challenge or intervene in the way that we are conditioned to perceive these states. They also raise problematic and interesting questions for practitioners who specialise in working with children regarding the ethics of creation or how artists have approached the task of working with children as performers in experimental works for adults, including how the question of child agency in the process is considered and how this is balanced with the ambitions of an adult artist who is responsible for the dramaturgical frames that surround the child performer. These are the same questions that this image raises for me. So, these are the things I thought about. This is so brief. Um, I went on a research journey where I investigated the symbolic and constructed nature of childhood, the instability and contingency of the category of child, how children often represent opposing dominant imaginaries of wicked or innocent, and how they are read often in performance as creepy but cute, and how they symbolically act as placeholders for possible futures. I also looked at the models of practice relevant to working with children in contemporary performance. I looked at the historical relationship between children in entertainment in Victorian times, the emergence of a pedagogical and participatory model of practice in theatre for education, the relationship this has to theatre for young audiences, and all of the frameworks that have defined youth arts practice over the last 40 years. My research also led me to the discovery of the different models of childhood, and these are articulated predominantly in the social sciences. These models include the property model, number one. So this is an understanding of childhood as a state that requires a considerable amount of regulation and intervention by adults, a state which must be contained and subordinate and is understood by historical so social science scholars as the property model. And this is the idea that children are the property of adults, still the dominant model. The deficit model, number two. So this is the notion that contemporary childhoods have become regulated states, that children's vulnerability is emphasised as society constructs a narrative around children that insists on viewing them through a deficit lens. Rather than seeing what they might be capable of, society is more inclined to see what they are not. And the third model, the rights-based model, 
and it is this last model of understanding children and childhood that my research project has focused on. So childhood studies scholars say that the child as a discrete category is disappearing as representations of children move from simple to sophisticated and reflect the acknowledgement in international law that children are not merely becomings but beings. The UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which turns 30 years old this year, offers a more comprehensive conception of childhood and demands a transformation in the way that children are viewed. The rights-based approach to conceptualising children and their evolving capacity is not necessarily a common or dominant approach in contemporary Western society, but it does uh, say that adults' complicity in constructing children's vulnerabilities is being questioned and challenged within legal, educational, medical and health frameworks. So I became very interested in how a rights-based approach might be conceptualised through creative practice. And very specifically, what does this mean in an Australian context? So these are the research questions that I set out to answer. I'm not going to read them out. Um, but I used a praxis approach. So this is the idea of theory imbricated within practice. So my PhD is 50% performance, a, a production, a piece of work, and 50% theory. Um, and these questions here led me to identify the constituent features of a rights-based approach to working with children in contemporary performance. So what I mean is, what do I do to make a rights-based approach? So. The research positions the ideas of a rights-based framework to working with children as an effective resistance measure to the dominant protectionist attitude toward children, which largely limits children to the domestic and the education realms. The constituent features of a rights-based approach respond directly to a number of articles within the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, including but not limited to Article 12, which you can see up here, and Article 13. Drawing on these obligations as framing statements for the intentions of collaborative creative practice, I looked at three key features um, that are part of a rights-based framework of working with children in performance. The first of these is the idea that a rights-based approach includes blended methodologies from the practices and philosophies that underpin both youth arts and inclusive arts practice. So youth arts fundamentally acknowledges children's cultural agency and inclusive arts practice works to remove the barriers to participation that a child may face. The second feature is this idea of acknowledging and addressing power imbalances. So this specifically refers to a commitment from an adult collaborator to cede power where possible and to resist the expert amateur dichotomy that's inherent in adult-child social relations. The third approach is, the, is that you must concentrate on child-led, child-centric contexts and dramaturgies. So this creative approach must focus on children's strengths and capacities rather than their perceived deficits or vulnerabilities, and in doing so provide a platform for the sometimes disruptive insertion of children's ideas, opinions, views, visions into a range of contexts and discourses. So the creative strategies that are part of this approach begin with um, something called the Eight Ways Framework. And I've got the website up there because I would really encourage you, if you haven't heard of this, to have a look at it. Eight Ways is a flexible starting point for dialogue, a culturally safe point of entry for um, cross-cultural exchange that articulates eight culture ways of learning that engage with a rights-based methodology. So the very first lens to this practice that I apply is a First Nations lens. Um, from the Eight Ways framework, specifically, they talk about story sharing, which is the idea of connecting to lived or imagined experience, working non-verbally and kinesthetically, and holding, holding space that is brave, safe and inclusive. And these are the key underpinning fundamental principles of this creative practice. And so what might the impact of a rights-based approach be? Why would practitioners consider it? The vulnerability paradigm that circulates around notions of childhood and children themselves positions these states as disconnected from ideas of cultural and civic agency, and this is demonstrated quite clearly 
by the recent public commentary driven by adults around children striking around the world and leaving school to join marches in cities and towns in support of action on climate change. And of course, all of this was inspired by a 16-year-old Greta Thunberg from Stockholm, Sweden. This act of political engagement elicits highly contrasting opinions in the public and political arena. There are those who are delighted that young people could be so passionate about matters of public policy and see great hopes for the future. And then there are those who believe, including Federal Education Minister Dan Tian and PM Scott Morrison, that children are being used as puppets of the extreme left of politics and argue that if children are not entitled to vote, they are not entitled to strike. That's a direct quote. What the climate strikes clearly illustrate is that the idea of children as rights bearers, as individuals with entitlement to civic and cultural agency, is still decidedly challenging to adult-centric institutions. There was little to no public commentary around the idea that children were not only entitled to be heard and listened to on matters that affect them, in this case, the very serious issue of climate change policy, but that these rights are enshrined in an international legal document that Australia and many other countries across the world are a signatory to. It is therefore possible to suggest that despite Australia's endorsement of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, that in practice, the dominant attitudes toward children seem to indicate that adults believe children are limited in terms of their capacity to contribute to public discourse, politics, policy and civic concerns. What I do not wish to argue for in this research is the idea of the child being impervious to vulnerability. Invulnerability is not an option for any human being. And I acknowledge that the state of childhood has both differences and similarities to the state of adulthood. I would advocate for the importance of, of adults finding new ways of conceptualising childhood as a state of being, as unstable and contingent as adulthood. Childhood is no more a state of becoming than we are all in a state of becoming. The challenge for adults is to develop an awareness of and a sensitivity to the protectionist agenda that circulates around children in order to develop strategies to resist it and to understand that this paradigm emphasises children's vulnerability at the expense of their evolving capacity. In this way, we might start to see the voices and perspectives of children accounted for in a range of contexts and realms. In fact, given that on September the 24th, 2009, Greta Thunberg and 15 other child leaders from around the world filed a lawsuit to sue five of the biggest polluting countries for violations of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, I would go so far as to suggest that the future depends on adults taking up this challenge or risk the wrath of future generations. Thanks. <laughs>